Um, and this is my book, The Glitch, and it came out in May from Doubleday. So it's it's, it's about a uh, a CEO whose name is Shelly Stone, and she's a type A workaholic, kind of crazed with this desire to be as efficient as possible, optimize her time, um, do everything possible to maximize her time and live a lot of the Silicon Valley CEO tropes that you hear about. She power poses, you know, like a panther to build up her confidence before meetings. She does a lot of, she t gives TED Talks. She um, does um, sort of everything to be as productive as possible. She's also a mom and she's also uh, married and those aspects of her life are starting to collide. Shelly is the main character and it's written in a first person voice. She's the I, you know, um, the you'll hear. And then her husband's name is Raphael or Rafe. And he is also a, he's also successful and hardworking, but he's starting to get tired of the pace of their life. And so in the section that I'm gonna read, it's about kind of going, going back in their relationship to when they were first dating and when some of these problems were starting to become apparent that they were not um, maybe as well matched as they thought they were. Sven, my first real boyfriend, once described me as wholesome. Being from Wisconsin, I guess, working hard, having a sturdy, symmetrical appearance, a center part in my hair, a willingness to eat pizza, then. Sven was also my boss, but that was how it worked at startups. There was no time for extracurricular social life. You had to make do with the people at work. We were so busy, we barely had time to talk, let alone make out while waiting for databases to rebuild. After we broke up, he got extremely rich and now lives somewhere remote and self-sustaining to prepare for peak oil. I learned a lot from the relationship. One, peak oil is gonna be a big problem. Two, better to go public too soon than too late with your IPOs and your relationships. And three, don't read his email. After that, I mostly kept my head down and worked. I couldn't say I was lonely because there were always people around, like the programmer at the next desk. Once he gave me a pierogi but I was still looking for something more. I didn't necessarily think I'd find it. There weren't many people who matched my drive to excel. But meanwhile, I had my career to focus on. I had a workplace that fed me nutritiously and handed over new power cords anytime I reached into my bag and couldn't find mine. Work also equipped me with a fleece hat and a coffee mug printed with soon outdated versions of our company's logo. Work was satisfying, it was frustrating, it was at times enraging, it occupied the full range of emotional possibilities and it took everything. Sometimes I dreamed of going on vacation, backpacking through Thailand or fly fishing in hip boots in a cold glacial stream, but no matter how scenic it looked or how much fun an activity was supposed to be, I always felt away from work that I was missing out. Rafe didn't seem like the type of person who would be my boyfriend, which was part of why I liked him. I thought of him as someone I'd remember fondly from a different future. On one of our early dates, Rafe and I went for a walk and got ice cream. It was a nice night and we walked around in the dusk, cyclists tooting past us, not headed anywhere in particular. I enjoyed it and I think he did too. He kept reaching over and squeezing my hand. Afterward, we strolled to the Caltrain station on California Avenue actually. <laughs> I kissed him goodnight and he went around the other side to head back. I, I kissed him goodbye and went around the other side to head back to the office. He looked confused. Enjoy your night, I called from the opposite platform. He looked startled. My train pulled away and I watched him standing there licking his ice cream. The next day he called to find out what had come up. Nothing, I said, I just had some work to do. On a date a few weeks later, we went to a screening of Dog Day Afternoon in Palo Alto. During the movie, I got a few texts from work and answered them by leaning over with my head between my knees, my phone underneath the seat. After that, I couldn't concentrate on the hostage situation in the bank anymore and decided to go back to the office. Ray followed me out of the theater and seemed annoyed. He thought we should watch the rest of the movie and either go back to one of our apartments together, his vote, or failing that, say goodnight and go home. I thought this was an intrusive request and illogical. What made that option superior? Why did it matter where we went, where I went? Net, net, I said, it shakes out the same way. We're not together, but in my preferred option, I have better internet and a large monitor. Why should the time we spend together have to fall at the end of the day? It's the difference between lunch and dinner, he said. Lunch is a break, dinner is intimate. You can let down your guard. I don't usually eat dinner. Don't you want to spend time with your boyfriend? I blushed, I hadn't referred to him as my boyfriend and I wouldn't have done it yet. 
The thrill of the acknowledgement was dampened by the sense the privilege might be taken away before I could use it. I looked at my watch miserably. I gave you two hours, I said. It came out like a whine, but also pleadingly. We can look up how the movie ends. I've already seen it twice, he said equably. It's okay. He hugged me. It's been nice, and I hope we'll stay in touch, I said, attempting to break up with him out of duty and decency, not because I wanted to. He looked surprised. You don't even want to try? I felt like Rafe had a lot of options, but when you're the kind of person I am, with jagged edges, a specific sort of puzzle piece, you click when you can. So I tried. I looked for out-of-the-box solutions. I could get up earlier to, walk, to work, I suggested. We could eat later, he offered, meeting me halfway, like at midnight or never. That amused me. And so I tried with all the effort and dedication I brought to everything. And I thought he'd try that hard, too. It was so good, I didn't want to see any problems. Very quickly, we started talking about the future with an implied sense that we would be together. We were inquiring about each other's tastes and hopes and desires, and once, exhilaratingly and riskily, the possibility of a baby. After the fact, the way the same way you discuss the thickness of the ice while sw strolling out across a frozen pond, we were already, in a way, far from shore. What's your dream, he said. What do you want to do? What do I want to do? I was surprised he didn't know. This, exactly this, all the time. I gestured around. We were not actually standing on a frozen pond. We were eating sandwiches he brought over at lunchtime, and we were sitting on a low wall in the atrium of my office building, enjoying one of the many pleasant days the peninsula is known for. I want to do my part to turn Gorvis into a household word and a billion dollar industry and an unstoppable force in communications. What about you? He laughed. Right, me too. It was sunny out and he looked sunny eating a prosciutto sandwich, the sun on his face. Really? You want to join Gorvis? Well, let's see. He chewed. It was taking him a long time to think of his goal. I thought of mine every morning when I first woke up. But I loved him and I waited. Okay, this is a good one. I'd like to win my club squash championship this year. A smile and a squint letting me on a secret. I think I've got it in the bag. And I thought, perfect, he's hungry to win. But later after we'd been married for a few years, I realized it was about the wrong thing. So that's kind of a flashback sequence from the book when they are first dating. And most of the book takes place later when they've been married, they have children, and her company is starting to, to go under a little bit. And I, I have never read that section to a group before, but I think subconsciously I wanted to read it because I got married here um, 16 years ago. So it seems sort of like we should go back to an origin story, although I am not remotely like the main character in the book. And James, well, he's, you're, he's, nice. he's a nice man, so you're, you're, you're closer. I started writing this um, in 2013, I think, the fall of 2013. And that was a time when it, um, Sheryl Sandberg was very much in the news. She had published Lean In, and she had done that TED Talk, and she was there was a lot about kind of her ability to, her advice to women in the workforce and how you should scale up your career, not scale it down, uh, that women should kind of work harder. Uh, and so I felt like I was, in one hand, reading all this stuff about how glorious it is to be you know, a high-powered woman and seeing in my own life women who I had always thought would continue to work forever and be really successful at it who suddenly couldn't for various reasons that were really good reasons. Like you, you kind of couldn't hear their story and not think, yeah, I think you probably do have to leave. But at the same time, it doesn't seem like the greatest societal solution, even if it's what you would advise your friend to do. So that kind of conflict and kind of was part of what made me start to write this because I kept thinking, well, what would you have to do to succeed in kind of this moment? And I think what you would have to do is be oblivious to a lot of things. I mean, I think that there's no real way. You have to kind of make these very clear trade-offs, which are trade-offs that dads make all the time. But they're, but they're weird and jarring when you see them still in women. And so I wrote a character who is just focused on work 100%. She is not conflicted. She doesn't feel guilty. She is very much um, living kind of the way of, high-powered dad might live his life. And, and yet, there's something very still, I think, that we are still kind of not quite ready to think about with that. So when I wrote this book, I didn't, I felt like I was totally disconnected. I lived in, outside Philadelphia. I felt like I was totally disconnected from writing and writers and the whole 
publishing industry. And I had to just kind of cold query agents, you know, where you write a letter, email now, and you say, you know, here's, here's my book, and this is what it's about, and this is who I am. And it worked, I mean, you never, you always think that's not really gonna work, but it did work in this case. And I had one sex scene and they took it out. <laughs> <laughs> I, I feel like that's like an example of how like maybe you shouldn't write about sex. If like you try to write one scene and they were, and then the very first, very first notes from the editor, she's like, I'd like to just lose that, is that okay? <laughs> and I thought, well, sure, let's just. <laughs> so I think they were trying to make the book more commercial because they think that's sort of what you're trying to do with books is make them more appealing, Oddly. I don't know how successful they were at that, but that was the effort. But uh, yeah, they definitely didn't have me add more sex. That was apparently not, not the direction to go.